Good morning. Uh, this is the chapter on, we, we call it handling of data, but it really is a chapter of kind of what we would call instructions that you might not find uh, in another type of computer system, but that are specifically in the um, PLC because at the time that uh, PLCs were developed, uh, they were rather limited, but people found that they needed these kinds of instructions. So we talk a little bit about uh, those instructions that are unique, that we find that uh, usually the other computer systems have other ways of doing these kind of functions, but these are things that were needed in the plant floor and so that they were provided for. And that's pretty much why this chapter is there. I call it a specialty instruction chapter. In, in my introduction, usually as I say this is a, a uh, chapter on specialty instructions that you probably wonder why they're the way they are, but um, that's just the way that they've, they've done these. So, uh, and, and they're more uh, from the Allen Bradley side than they are from the Siemens side because of the idea that as program controllers, and, and we, we introduced this in chapter one, this idea that the Siemens processors from day one were a little bit more uh, open and uh, you could do just about anything with them in, in, in order to program an application. The, there was a lockdown on the way that you could program the Allen Bradley or the uh, American processors because they wanted the electrician to be able to maintain it. And in order to do that, you had to kind of bring it down to a level that an electrician could understand. And while they do understand numbers and they do understand some logic, basically they wanted it to just be a relay timer counter replacer. So you had to add these other instructions in because you needed all these other things and you had a computer there, why not? And that's why uh, we find these instructions. So again, um, not to embarrass anybody, but this is stuff that came in as the result of um, the, the the rules that basically said in the United States that you had to have uh, electricians being able to maintain it and even to program them. And uh, that's why you had to have these special instructions. So we're dealing with, with uh, a number of instructions, but two areas really one is of queuing operations using FIFO and LIFO, and the other is uh, tracking of product, and that's uh, another one we're going to talk about and how the tracking programs were set up and, 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 and many of the PLCs. But I'm going to talk about an alternative, and I'm also going to talk about some other ideas on, on the tracking issue. And uh, we're going to give you some alternatives to some of those these, these approaches, but even then, uh, you're going to find that people still use these instructions. So the, the base is that you, you have instructions that are computer-like, that, that were microprocessor or microcomputer uh, assembly level programming. And we give you these, and they're, they're um, AND and OR of 16 or 32 bits, exclusive OR, invert, that type of thing. And uh, they also have special instructions called decode and encode and select and mux and demux. And we don't understand every little piece of every one of these instructions, but we know that we have them. We also have the shift instructions so that you can shift left, shift right, rotate left, rotate right. And we go through some of these instructions and give you the, uh, the basis for how the instruction works. And if I were to print this instruction out for Siemens or print this instruction out for Allen Bradley, you would not see any real difference in the way that the execution of these instructions occur. They're the same. So after the original instructions were, were out there, they basically said, we're going to give you all the instructions like the instructions that you've been accustomed to in microcomputers, microprocessors for, in, for, um, for use in uh, in, in Boolean logic. And we're going to give them to you in 16 to 32 bit in, in, in information or in, in words and you can decide how you want to deal with them. Okay, so that's, I'm just going to go through this real quickly because that's the basis. That's the basis that we have of these instructions. Now, we're going to 
scoot through these and I'm scooting right now through these we do have a MUX lab that we talked about already, but this is a little different than that. But it gives you um, the ability to compact something into a MUX instruction and then take it apart in the DMUX instruction. Uh, moving along here, we're going to find that these instructions have descriptions that you can look at from Alan Bradley or Siemens, and they're basically the same. All right. We're getting through them. So we get down to the Allen Bradley, and you're lo and behold, they're the same. Pretty much. They have a little different, but they're basically the same. Okay. Um, Siemens does not have a clear instruction. Alan Bradley does have a clear instruction, which is that's a nice instruction to have. You can always load a zero, but again, that's um, and Siemens does not have this ex exact instruction. Bitfield distribute. I don't think they have exactly the same instruction. But if you need these instructions, read up on them and they're just for your use as you need them. Okay. They have the shift instructions, the instruct, rotate instructions, just the same as Siemens does. Okay, so now we get to the FIFO. These are instructions I don't think that Siemens has, although I'm not really sure, but you could certainly build these instructions. First in, first out. So, why would we need this instruction? Why would we need something like this? Is what it boils down to. Well, this is a stack, a stack application. And if you are in a queue, you want to be able to first come, first serve. In order to do that, you have to have some kind of a stack with a manipulating that says who got there first. So, here's an application. I have a mixed tank main mix tank and I have the uh, various day tanks so this tank A, B, C, D, E, F are what we would consider day tanks so each one of those would support a line of canning or whatever we're right up the street from a Pepsi canning plant or a distribution plant and I would imagine that the Pepsi company makes their product, their Pepsi, Diet Pepsi, uh, other uh, Mountain Dew, etc., etc., in a mix tank, a main mix tank. And then they have various lines that, that, that do the actual canning. And one would be a Pepsi line, one would be a Diet Pepsi line, one would be a Mountain Dew line. And I don't know all their other flavors, but basically each of these lines would be able to hold quite a lot of material but as you can the product obviously these these day tank levels go down so what do you do when the level goes to a low level what do you do say tough luck uh, we're at the end of the day we're gonna gonna make any more well most of the time you would say no we would call an automated system that would say hey main mix tank make another batch for that particular tank and you see that and and basically your automated system would actually do that so when for instance tank F would go low in this case it gets to a low level switch you would say hey main mix tank mix me another mix of, of tank F type so you would put it on the stack and because you are constantly looking at that stack to say is there any reason I mean you, you put F on the stack and it says I'm I, I, I want to be served there's nothing ahead of it and the main mix tank is not mixing anything so it immediately pulls F off the stack and you'd see it there for an instant and then it goes away so F to the stack off the stack starting to mix tank F so on the stack 
and then immediately you see it go out of the stack and you're mixing it. While that is happening, however, some of the other tanks start to, to go low. What happens when that happens? B and D went low. You're mixing F and the first one that went low was B and then the second one went low was D. So they populate the stack. They're like the person at the grocery counter that are waiting while the person ahead of them is being checked out and they're in order. The first person that got there is B. The second person that got there is D. Now you say, but what if D is actually more needed than B? You have to manipulate the stack. This doesn't work that way. It's basically first come, first serve. And that's most the most democratic way of doing it. If you say, well, we have to do something because D is more needed or whatever, then you would have to manipulate the stack. You'd have to do some special thing. But basically this program or this instruction, this FIFO instruction is just set up to handle as if they're all of equal need. They're all of equal value. So it is not set up to do some kind of a prioritized value system. But again, if you're asked to do that, you have to go into the stack and manipulate, maybe move D ahead of B, that type of thing. So after F is full, you do B, and then you look at your stack, and D is the only one left on the stack. So that's the basis for a FIFO instruction. FIFO input instruction would be to move onto this, the FIFO load would be to take it off, and then everything else moves up. That's how FIFO works. LIFO works the same way. Last in, first out works the same way. And you find some applications for each one. Okay, so we want to talk a little bit about simulation. And uh, I, I've encouraged you to, if you were interested, to use the um, PLC uh, Fiddle or this the uh, Codasys or you may be using the Siemens or the Allen Bradley simulator package as opposed to the, the actual programming of the hardware. So it's your, your choice. But there's other types of simulation and I want to talk to you about one of those and, and one of them has to do with bottlenecks and when bottlenecks appear um, what what to do about that. So it's usually an industrial engineer that gets involved with uh, looking at bottlenecks and and, uh, and trying to um, figure out how to eliminate bottlenecks. But you have the ability, because you have the program, to basically eliminate some of these bottlenecks already. So if there's a timing issue with something, how long it takes to do something, you can actually look at that and say, okay, now why are things not moving through the line as they should? And you have the access to the program to actually make things move at a faster clip, maybe. And uh, that may be something that, that, you, that you would do. But there are programs that actually do the simulation for you. And I, I, I know that uh, Siemens has these application programs as well, but... Um, Alan Bradley definitely has one of these, and uh, it's a it's a uh, useful package, and it uh, is uh, I, I right off forget the name of it, but uh, both Alan Bradley and Siemens have these packages, and um, they're 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 very useful. Okay, so it's my my mind right now what the name of it is, but uh, believe me that they they both they both have them. All right, so what do these programs do? Well, they statistically look at bringing in product and then running the product through the line and at each station establishing a statistical distribution of how long it takes to do the application or do the uh, do the operation and then you feed that information into a program that then graphically shows the product running down the line and shows you if there are any bottlenecks. And you say, well, that really doesn't help me that much. Well, it may not, but it might. And uh, if you are in some companies, uh, this is done a lot. Um, and other companies, it's ignored. But it is a statistical programming package 
that predicts if there's going to be bottlenecks and where these bottlenecks are and how bad they can be. So as you look at statistical simulation, uh, you may decide that it is something that you need to do. It is a different program than what is available for um, it's for Alan Bradley it's ARIMA A R I M or, or ARENA excuse me A R E N A and it is a statistical programming package that allows you to program a uh, process to see where the bottlenecks are. Um, so some companies have used this to great extent and uh, other companies don't but I'm just telling you that you should look at it as a methodology for being able to um, to see if there are bottlenecks in your process. So you can maybe just look at your process and see where the bottlenecks are or you may not be able to. But if you're losing product, this is one of the ways that, or if your line is, if you think it's slow, if you think, well, why is this so slow? Uh, and many times you can just look and say, uh, it just, it, we're slow because it takes time to do this to this to this. But uh, if you want to speed it up, sometimes you can. And sometimes it takes a program like Arena to basically bring that to a head and say, this is what we're doing. This is why it's working the way it is. So at least you know that. It's another, another statistical simulation package that is supported by Alan Bradley and Siemens and each of them have their own but it's a, a way to determine statistically if you're going to have bottlenecks and where they are. Okay so uh, I want to talk a little bit about a, an, an instruction for shifting and this has to do with tracking. Now when I first uh, started as an engineer I wrote a tracking program that was very extensive and um, I did not use this technique and I didn't have a PLC, I had a computer. But basically in that instance I used um, a procedural language to be able to go through a table and be able to keep track of the, the uh, parts, the, it was glass on a conveyor and each section of the conveyor I tracked the uh, glass, the leading edge of the glass from where it was introduced to the conveyor to where it was released to the next conveyor. And at the end of each conveyor we had a limit switch. Today I don't think they do a limit switch or they don't have a limit switch at the end of each conveyor section. But in that era that we, we did have a limit switch and it basically con it, it resynced if we were out of out of a tolerance or if we were off track it would resync us. But anyway, so um, how is this done? And uh, how do you track a part down a line well, uh, you have to have some kind of a pulse that says, I have traveled so far. And those pulses can either come in at a rate that is slower than the scan rate of the program controller or a rate that is faster than the scan rate of the program controller. If they come in at a rate as fast as program, the program controller, you have to have something called a um, high-speed counter or high-speed counter card or some kind of a high-speed counter interface in order to be able to... Uh, to look at that number. So every time you look at that number, it's a number since the last time you looked at it. And if you look at it every 10 milliseconds or whatever on a clock, you can say I've traveled 30 pulses or 500 pulses or 8,000 pulses since the last time I looked. And that gives you a length of how far it is before you're ready to do the next action or whatever. So that's a number that comes in. Now if, if, if it comes in slower than the scan rate of the program controller, in other words, if the pulse on to off or off to on to back to off is slower than the scan rate of the program controller you can use digital input so you basically have your choice of which way you're going to track now the off to on to off pulse train is the way that is typically used for this kind of an application so what you do is every time you get an off to on to off you basically um, move one bit you shift one space in the shift register and uh, that is the uh, process that we have here so basically each time you see an off to on which represents one inch of travel or two inches of travel or whatever you move 
the product one space. Now the ones are representing these parts. In other words, this is the yellow part. It's I, I make them yellow. This is the brown part. I make them brown. But really we don't have yellow ones or do we don't have brown ones. We just have ones or zeros. So basically every time we move one inch, we move or shift right in this array one state or one one bit. Now what is good about this? Well, it's very visual. And for someone who likes to see things visual, you see these dancing bits going through this register and you can say, when it gets to a certain point, I want to do something with it. What's bad about it? Well, obviously you need a separate shift register for each type. In other words, the yellow type need a shift register. The brown type need a different shift register. The green ones need a different one and, and the uh, yellow ones need a different one. You say, well, I don't have green and yellow, but I do have uh, barcodes. And those barcodes can be equated to a separate part of the country. So each part of the country, I'm going to have a separate um, um, side conveyor. So I'm going to go down a conveyor. And then when I get to the one that says go to Albuquerque, I'm going to have an arm come out that sh takes that box and puts it in the Albuquerque side conveyor. Or maybe you're going to go to St. Louis. So you have a St. Louis side conveyor. Or you may have another one that goes side conveyor. And you say, is this ever used? It's used a lot. This technique is used a lot for tracking of product. I used it in a in, uh, program in 1980 for tracking of uh, the product of, uh, of a woven, roven, or just roven uh, uh, fiberglass and, and, um, and, and spools and uh, going down with a, in a tote with a barcode and so this one's going to this comp country or this this area this is going to this area and there were 19 side conveyors and, and they basically just stacked up based on the barcode so you read the barcode go down and transfer one of those 19 points it worked like great it worked great so we had to have 19 shift registers to do that that's okay you can watch the bits going down it's perfect it works it works very 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 well it's graphical. You can see it. It takes a lot of computer time in order to do this. It's just one of those things where if you want to spend the time doing this, you can. It just takes a lot of time. And, and there's, like I said, there's 19 different um, shift registers, one for each item, and you have to basically track each one separately. So do we do this kind of thing in other plants besides fiberglass plants? Well, UPS, I think, is a classic example, and I've heard the number of miles of conveyors that are in some of these um, areas, and I think Louisville is the biggest one, and I've heard the number 600 miles of conveyor, and I'm not sure if that's accurate or not, but how would you like 600 miles of conveyor with all these boxes flying down and having to go to side conveyors, and how do you, how do you track them? This is one way of doing it. It's obviously a very visual way, and it's one way that people have of tracking product down a line. Uh, here's your spoked wheel, and here's the, the gives you the zero to one, zero to one, zero to one, zero to one, zero to one. Okay, so that gives you a little bit of an idea how that process works and how that program works. You say 1980 is 40 years ago, Ted. That's quite a while back. Uh, just about three or four years ago, I had a fellow in uh, here that took the course, and, and uh, he said that uh, the Livion's Ford tracking was done the same way even today. So this tracking pretty much has stayed as a standard for a lot of companies over the years. And as they're tracking product down a line, they want to see those ones and zeros dancing down those, uh, those chef registers. Okay, so again, if you have product going down there and, and, and you'd say, well, can't I just put a photo eye there and, and, and see this? Many times it's not easy to put a photo eye in some places, like a spray booth. Anytime you put a photo eye in a spray booth, what happens to it? The lens gets coated, right? And you can't see it after a little bit and it stops working. So you don't do that. You, you see what you have out here and you track it through and you spray it inside and then, and then and the way it goes. What's the logic for this? What's the logic for this? Well, it's very simple. 
There's your bit shift right instruction. Here's my instruction that uh, introduces the, the bit into the shift register. And here is the, the count that says go to a certain point and turn the spray on. And here's the one that says turn the spray on for the, for the yellow. So basically you're just looking at the shift register and when it gets to a certain point, you're turning on your output, spraying at a certain point, spraying right in here. You say, well, if it's a little bit off, what do I do? Well, I spray instead of from here to here, I'd spray from here to here or whatever. But I can move that those bits around where I turn the sprayer on and off, and it works very, 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 very well. That's a very good example of using this application. Very graphic, very easy, and um, it's very usable. Okay. Is that the only way to go? Uh, obviously, I'm letting you know that it is not the only way to go. But now we've talked about SLC because we've talked about what? We've talked about the old style Allen Bradley, the SLC, the shift line, or the, uh, um, their old processor line called the slick SLC, and we've called it SLC. But what are we also referring to when we talk about SLC? We're talking about a language, and this is the language that is Allen Bradley's and Siemens and it is the procedural language. So this is the language, and I'm introducing it from the Siemens point of view, but it's the same with Alan Bradley, that you can do a procedural, like a for next loop. You can do for next loops, you can do this exact same thing you could be if you were writing in C, or other, like Pascal, or another language like that. This is all you have, these are the, the language uh, statements that you have in SLC. So how would you do that? Well, you just start writing, and then you would actually be able to create a procedural program like that. Now, what's, what's bad about this? Well, if it's running in the background, and your scan dependency is, it, it, it can take quite a while to solve some of these loops. If you have a loop within a loop, it takes a lot longer than if you just have a simple loop. A loop within a loop within a loop takes a lot longer because you're multiplying three times something. It takes a lot longer to do a loop within a loop within a loop. So you're basically sending it out and saying, I hope it gets done before the scan watchdog says we ran out of time and we have to start over again. So you have a period of time that you allow the program to run before you say, okay, enough is enough. We have to go on with life. So your scan can vary in time. In other words, if you solve some of these little programs, they can take a while to solve. And that was one of the fears, and it is one of the fears that you the people have when you're writing programs in the program controller that you do these looping equation these looping programs and they soak up a lot of time and they won't make it around before you have to start again so that's one of the reasons that people were afraid of them and that's why this language this SLC language was not available until much later in the development of the program controller but it's here now and it's available and you can use this now how would you use this well Again, I'm not going to go through all the details because this is not a class on programming of C, but it, if it were, we would go through in detail. But I want you to understand that um, it's it's very doable, okay? It's very doable. And I want to show you this algorithm that actually was used for um, tracking of uh, parts of glass in the old days with a computer that only had 16k of memory in it and about half of that was taken up by the executive program so we only have about eight seven or eight k of memory to even turn around in and those are 16-bit word memory and then we had uh, the uh, all the things that were going on with this with this machine with this with this plant all had to be serviced in that seven or eight k of, of memory so how did we make that and we had 66 sections of conveyors so that gives you a little bit of a, of a perspective so basically how did we do tracking well that's that's what this little thing is it actually shows you a a table called like a uh a, the the part table for this section of conveyor now we had 66 sections of conveyor on that machine so you would have a a word, a 16-bit word, and half of that word would be the pattern number, and that would be out of 255 or 250, 255 uh, patterns, and then the position in the uh, 
conveyor, a 0 to 255. So basically you have a number of the pattern and then a number of where you're at in the um, conveyor. So this would be part number one and it would be the pattern number for part number one and then the position would be where it was at in the from the beginning of the conveyor. Part number two would be here, its pattern number would be here, and its position in the, in the conveyor would be this. So this would be the longest number, this would be the shorter number. And then we, we only said how many pieces could be in there. I said five or six, so basically we only had a table that was five or six deep. So when this got to the end of that table, when it got to the end of that uh, section, we would move the pattern and the position would start back at zero in the next section. So we would we'd get to the end, we would sink it in and start it in the next one. What is this good for? Well, the pattern is forms a lookup table, and when the position gets to a certain position on this conveyor, we would say we have an action. So when the position hits the action position, we would look up the pattern, the pattern number, and we would say, is there an action for this pattern at that position? And if there was, we would perform it, like a squaring head like a, um, you name it, whatever we were doing with that piece. If, are we going to transfer it? What are we going to do with it? But basically, in a position, you would either stop the conveyor or you would do a squaring head or you would do something else, but you would do whatever you're going to do at that position. The action position meshed up with the pattern's action or didn't. And sometimes you would use a certain squaring head or a cutter head or whatever, and then you would do that or you wouldn't do that and it would all be based on the pattern. So you'd have a lookup table of patterns, like recipes, and then that pattern would have, do I do something at this point on this conveyor or not? And it would tell you whether you do or not. Okay, so that gives you an idea of a different way of doing it. Now what's good about this? We can do a lot more in a lot shorter period of time this is much more efficient coding wise. What's bad about it? You can't see it, can you? You can't see bits moving on the line. Not as easy to track the parts with this design as it was with the other. So what did we have to do? We had to use diagnostics programming, didn't we? If one part clobbered over another part, in other words, if the position of this piece came over the position of this piece, what happened? Somehow this piece got lost. As in glass, it broke and it went down the chute. And this one, clobber this one, we lost it. So basically you would know that you lost one if this one overrode this piece. So then the conveyor doesn't hit the limb switch, doesn't hit the limb switch, doesn't hit the limb switch. Part two comes down here and gets to that point. What happened to part one? We don't know, but we know it ain't there anymore. So we basically lost part one. Something happened to it. It broke or it, it's down the chute and it's gone. So that's how you keep track of parts in a, on a glass, um, a glass line. That's one way of doing it. Anyway, so that's a different approach. Which way do you like better? It's your choice. At this point in time, it's your choice. But it gives you some options, doesn't it? It gives you some options of how to do tracking, and it makes you think a little bit more about if I want to track something, and what is really tracking? It's a lot of states, right? It's In this situation, it's a lot of states. It's 255 positions or 255 states. So each part can go down there, and you have 255 states in which to do something in. Okay, very different than um, the state tables before, but it is something that if you do want to track parts, and, and sometimes you do and sometimes you don't, but if you do, um, this is one way of doing it. Um, not always do we track parts. Sometimes we use um, a barcode to follow a part. Sometimes we use an RFID tag to follow a part. And that keeps us in sync with where we're at, just as well as the tracking. But the tracking, if you can track parts, is a very efficient way of, of tracking and doing things to a part as you move the part down the line. So it's your choice. So we come to this problem right here, and I'm not going to solve this problem for you, but I'm going to ask you this, this one right here now. So this problem was pre done previously, wasn't it? So in the old in the old one we just had two tanks, didn't we? Either the left one or the right one. Now we have four. So what are you going to do here? 
Well, the way to do this problem is not to do the logic the way that we did it before, which was to have, if you get sealed in one of them, you seal out the other three. Why would you not use the same logic for this application, and why would you maybe go to a FIFO? Because you write the logic in order, don't you? You write it first, then second, then third, then fourth. If you write it so that as soon as the one is satisfied and you go to the next one, let's say this one is the one that is being being serviced. Let's say this one goes empty, but this one had already gone empty. You're going to service this one before you do this one because your logic for this is ahead of the logic for this one. You see what I'm saying? It precludes the idea of who got there first. It just says, because I wrote this logic next, it hits here and then it precludes this one and it precludes this one. So this one may be over there starving while you're always satisfying this one. Not fair, is it? No. So basically what is this asking you to do? Write a FIFO and that would help you. So you write the FIFO once you've satisfied one and you go back to your FIFO stack and you say who was next? And that's the person you put in next and you see all the other ones out. When that one's done, then you say, who was next? You do that one, and then you do the next one. So this is asking to be done with a FIFO, as opposed to the way we did it before with a logic, straight logic. Okay, so now you've got a little bit of a different approach. And now we go back and we talk about how to build this with tracking. And I basically say, if you want to build one of these, you can. It's, it's up to you. Uh, but you could if you wanted to. And this would be the same thing with writing it with SLC or writing it with a procedure language. And this would be the same with uh, writing a uh, program to do uh, a queuing based system. And we're done. So have a good day. Take care.